it up. I think that's working. Yes, yes, we see your All screen. Good. Um, so when you're ready, please go ahead, Joshua. Sure. Well, um, hello, as, as you would have just heard, um, I'm Joshua Arthur. I'm a PhD student at the Queensland University of Technology. And in this presentation, I'll just be outlining a relatively simple study that we did recently on the effect of gate conductance on the characteristics of organic thin film transistors. And in particular, we're dealing with a class of low voltage transistors that use a hygroscopic dielectric layer. So organic thin film transistors or OTFTs take advantage of the properties of organic thin films. They can be incredibly thin, lightweight and flexible. They're often solution processable. So we can use different printing techniques, for example. They can also be biocompatible and biodegradable and ion permeable, which can all be very useful properties, particularly for electronics in sensing or biosensing applications where we want to work in close proximity to living tissue. So organic transistors have been widely studied for sensing applications and these sensors use a variety of different transistor architectures uh, and each have different operating mechanisms. And these include in very broad terms, field effect transistors and electrochemical transistors. Now each of these have their own advantages and limitations. Some are more appropriate for different circumstances, but we're interested in a class of OTFTs called a hygroscopic insulator field effect transistors or HIFETs. Um, in these devices, a hygroscopic or moisture absorbing dielectric material is commonly used. And this is uh, usually poly four vinyl phenyl or PVP. And when dry, this device works just as an ordinary OFET and we need tens of volts to operate it. But when it's moisturized, the phenyl groups um, of the PVP as a weak acid, they ionize and this liberates cations that are free to drift under the applied gate voltage and the large capacitances of the double layers that form at each interface is what enables us to have that low voltage operation, which is important for sensors, especially when we're operating in aqueous conditions, for example, because it enables us to avoid electrolysis that might be occurring at larger voltages. Um, so this behavior gives us the low voltage advantages of an electrolyte gated OFET or an OECT, uh, but in an easy to fabricate solid state form factor. And so these are the um, output and transfer characteristics for a pretty standard um, HIFET. And we can see some good uh, low voltage transistor behavior. Something that's uh, important to note about these devices is that they do require a reverse uh, gate bias to fully turn off. And uh, this has been speculated that this is due to the uh, a small doping effect from the uh, from the polar the polarity of the PVP phenyl groups, uh, and so we counteract that by uh, applying a positive gate voltage and forcing cations back toward the channel, uh, sort of counteracting that effect. Um, so to use these high FET devices as sensors, there has to be some way for an analyte uh, to interact with the device. And one way uh, to do this is to use a porous top gate electrode. And this allows the analyte to penetrate into the device and by either changing the capacitance or by doping the semiconductor layer, perhaps uh, this will modulate the channel current at which we can then detect. So our research group has previously reported a high fat proton sensor that uses uh, sulfonic acid functionalized mesoporous silicon nanoparticles. Um, these are a highly proton conducting solid state material. Um, and this is due to the moisture trapping properties of the functionalized pore structure. And so you can get protons hopping um, uh, sort of along the uh, trapped moisture. Um, and so these devices did make quite promising sensors. So this is the uh, sort of current modulation we observe when tested with hydrogen peroxide, uh, which is a, a common uh, sort of analyte we use. However, the change in the gate material, so the changing from the standard material to the nanoparticles does severely affect the transistor performance. So um, when we compare the output and transfer characteristics of the standard gate with the silicon nanoparticle gate, um, we can cl see, clearly see quite a, quite a uh, difference there. And we naturally attributed this to the uh, much poorer electrical properties of the new gate electrode compared with the standard gate, which is the polymer mixture P.PSS, it's a conductive polymer. Um, and this is very standard for high fets. So uh, we see quite a difference there. So to address this problem, we tried combining the nanoparticles with P.PSS 
and the increased gate conductance was very clearly associated with an improved transistor performance. So we decided to do a bit more systematic study to investigate this relationship. We want to better understand the effect on the transistor characteristics and, un and the underlying processes that might be uh, behind it. And so we also want to use this information to uh, develop guidelines to help us choose and optimize future porous gate electrodes for um, optimized sensors. So for this study, we chose to use the standard high fat structure, uh, P3HT, uh, polyhexathiophene kind of uh, material, uh, was used as the organic semiconductor. And the layers were spin coated on top of a glass substrate patterned with ITO contacts. And we used dropcast P.PSS as our model gate electrode. The electrical conductance, or inversely the resistance, I suppose, um, of the gate was varied by diluting the P.PSS solution. And so this results in varied film thicknesses, with the result being uh, different uh, P.PSS uh, conductances. Uh, let's begin the analysis by looking at the output and transfer characteristics. Um, on this slide, we have representative curves for high fets with 100%, 25%, and 6% P.PSS gate electrodes. This is a percent of the original uh, per solution as purchased, and we've diluted it with uh, deionized water. So the effect of the very thin 6% gate resembles the effect of the silicon nanoparticle gate. So this does suggest that we are seeing the same effect in both cases. Um, so overall, as we reduce gate conductance, we see a few things. So um, the on current or maximum current reduces, while the off or minimum current increases, indicating a reduced ability of the device to move ions in the moisturized PVP layer, and thus to uh, a reduced ability to modulate the charge density in the P3HD channel. So at the same time, we also see a uh, reduction in the gradient of the transfer curve. Um, or the transconductance, as well as this um, sort of distortion in the saturation regime, which we link to the uh, gate leakage current. So to more quantitatively compare these devices, we've extracted the key figures of merit and we're plotting them against the P.PSS ratio. So on this slide, we have on and off currents and the on off ratio. So the on current increases just as we saw in the previous slide. Uh, the off current is actually quite constant. So if you see, um, it doesn't change much until we get at to uh, very poorly conducting gates. And so this is likely an artifact of the limited gate voltage range that we sweep for the transfer curve. So at very low gate conductance, we don't actually reach the off state within this range of gate voltages. If we had uh, thought to extend the range of the sweep to larger voltages, uh, we might've been able to reduce these off currents. So what this is suggesting is simply that we need a larger positive voltage to turn the device off. So of course the on off ratio here is simply reflecting both sets of data. And what's interesting to note about the data here overall is that we approach a plateau as conductance increases. So beyond a certain conductivity, we no longer see significant performance gains in the device. So here are some other important figures of merit. Um, the threshold voltage here is just the theoretical minimum gate voltage required to start turning the device on. And so this is just extrapolated by the standard method of um, extrapolating from the transfer curve. And the higher conductance we have, so we see that as we're um, increasing uh, gate conductance, uh, we, the threshold voltage is closer and closer to zero. So this again is just indicating that with poorly conductive gates, they have difficulty turning the high fats off and we need larger voltages to do it. So the transconductance here, this is the gradient of the transfer curve, an approximate fit. Um, and this simply characterizes how well the change in the gate voltage can modulate uh, the channel current. And so this is clearly improving with larger conductance. And so finally, we have the product of mobility and capacitance, which we use as a good overall measure of device performance, especially when we don't know what the capacitance is um, or that the capacitance might be changing. And again, we see this familiar trend of improvement with gate conductance finally approaching a plateau at a higher conductivity. So in summary from this, just this small survey of the, the data, uh, we see decreasing gate conductance, uh, with uh, 
decreasing gate conductance is causing a decrease in the on current. We're increasing the off current. The threshold voltage is shifting to a more positive value um, away from zero. There is a decrease in transconductance and we're also decreasing the mobility capacitance product. So what we deduce from all this is that this is very consistent with a decrease in the magnitude of the effective gate voltage that's felt by the device compared with the actual applied gate voltage. So instead of the expected potential difference between gate and channel, the device behaves as though this is reduced, meaning weaker electric fields driving ions to either turn the device on or turn it off. So the question is, what is causing this effect? And the way we initially approached this question, because we were thinking very much along the terms of conductance and uh, resistance, was to consider a possible voltage loss along the gate as per Ohm's law, as though the gate were a resistor conducting a small current. And this would make sense given that we do measure a leakage current at the gate. So these diagrams show the layout of our high fets. Um, the gate voltage is applied to this ITO contact and must be transmitted along the length of the P.PSS gate to reach the channel area between the source and drain electrodes. So we were thinking that the voltage may be diminishing as the current flows over this length of resistive material. So to test this idea, I modified the gradual channel model, which is standard for modeling field effect transistors, to account for the decreased effective gate voltage. So this is the equation for the saturation current I came up with where we use a parameter beta to encapsulate factors such as the gate current and gate dimensions. And so this first row of figures shows the simulated output curves, first using the standard model and then the modified model with reduced gate conductances. Of course, this is simplified. We're assuming a constant gate current, which isn't strictly true, but approximately speaking, it covers the idea. Um, but of course, uh, and we're not showing how the uh, currents uh, will vary like that. Um, but well, what we're seeing here is that we're clearly decreasing the currents and we're reducing the transconductance, which is what we see. So when we plot it, um, so this figure, we uh, see the simulated saturation current using a fixed gate and drain, of course. And we're plotting it against these uh, simulated gate conductance. And we're re reproducing the behavior that we observed experimentally, where the channel current increases rapidly initially, and then begins to level out as gate conductance increases. Um, the gray line here, of course, is showing the uh, current calculated using the standard gradual channel model. And so this is what we're tending toward as we're um, increasing gate conductance. We're reaching that ideal situation. So we did think um, in reflection that this model did have some explanatory power and might be applicable in some cases but it isn't necessarily the only way to understand what could be happening. So another path we sort of pursued thinking about was to think in terms of the capacitance of the gate, which could also be changing along with its conductance or the thickness. We were, we were changing both. Um, and so there might very well be a change in this capacitance. And uh, because of the ion driven mechanism of these transistors, we need to consider contributions from the two capacitors that we effectively have, uh, which are electrical double layers at the gate PVP interface and then at the PVP channel interface. And because these are in series, the voltage uh, between the gate and the channel needs to drop across both capacitors. And this is important because the effective gate voltage depends on the voltage drop between the PVP layer and the channel, not necessarily the gate and the channel. So let's illustrate this effect with a potential diagram. So we're illustrating potential along the X axis and sort of the layers of the device along the Y. So um, the gate and channel will both be fixed at their respective applied voltages. This voltage difference needs to drop across both of the capacitors, but the amount that drops depends upon the capacitance of each double layer. So if we have a large gate capacitance, this initial drop will be small, leaving most of the voltage to drop across the PVP channel interface corresponding to a large effective gate voltage. That's very close to the applied gate voltage. Now, if the gate capacitance is small, however, we see the opposite effect and thus a smaller effective gate voltage. So this might very well be uh, underlying what we're seeing in our devices with poor gate conductance. So the conclusion we've drawn from this study, uh, which, is very, which is a small study we've done, 
um, is just that gate conductance or perhaps capacitance, which would probably correlate in a lot of ways, um, can significantly impact transistor characteristics due to the reduced effective gate voltage, which that, that definitely seems to be the case. Um, but only when conductance is quite low. So this is important. As we saw, we rapidly approach plateau as gate conductance increases. Uh, for our HIFETs, above around six micro Siemens is sufficient for good transistor characteristics. And we were able to confirm this by testing with a very high conductivity grade P.PSS, and we found no further performance gain. So it essentially behaves the same as the lower conductivity P.PSS. So for us, the important lesson is that we don't necessarily need to use very highly conductive materials for the gate electrode which potentially allows us to use a wide range of different materials for the fabrication of a porous electrode for our sensing applications. Um, as for other OTFT architectures, we do expect some similar behavior to occur, um, but the details would require further investigation and may depend on the device mechanisms. So finally, uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to just give a brief look at what we've been doing to apply this information to our sensors to build uh, porous and conductive electrodes uh, for our sensing applications. So our criteria are simply to find a material or perhaps a mixture of materials uh, that will give us sufficient conductance, so above that uh, six micro Simons um, uh, threshold, a good porosity to allow rapid ion penetration, that's important for good sensing, and the uh, water stability, of course, so the electrode isn't damaged when we expose it to the analyte. So we now know that we're able to use our poorly conducting materials to facilitate ion penetration, just so long as we're, um, we're able to combine it with a conductive material just enough to nudge the conductance above the threshold for a good transistor. So previous work has suggested that silicon nanoparticles and the P.PSS can be an effective combination. That's what we've, we've published on that previously. So this time we've experimented with different crosslinkers to produce a stable gate electrode. So this SEM image um, shows the surface of the electrode embedded with these clusters of nanoparticles. Uh, the gate connectivity is more than sufficient to enable good transistor characteristics. And the transistors are more sensitive and more stable than when using similar electrodes without the cross-linking. So this will form part of a larger study we hope to submit for publication later this year. Sorry about the noise in the background there. So to close, I would simply like to um, acknowledge my supervisory team, including principal supervisor, Dr. Sonia Yambem. This work was completed at the Central Analytical Research Facility operated by the Institute for Future Environments at PUT. And my work is supported by an Australian government program training, uh, research, Australian government research training program scholarship, I'd say that. Uh, thank you very much for listening. So we can shut this down. Thanks, Joshua. Uh, does anybody have any questions? For Joshua. Hi. I got a question. Yeah. Hi, Amantis. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, it's really cool to see that you are um, presenting mobility and capacitance product, which is really mm. what it's all about. I wonder why wouldn't you measure the capacitance? You actually can measure capacitance independently, and then you will know whether that's a mobility or capacitance that's playing tricks on your or the one that's responsible for the current? Yeah, well, we certainly would. Um, we didn't uh, have that uh, on the table while we were doing the experiments. We were trying to do a relatively simple thing, but we will certainly look into that in the future because it's definitely an important thing to know. We're actually studying that at the moment. So <laughs> maybe in some future publications, we'll have that information. Yeah, that's relatively easy. Either you do yeah. uh, classical impedance spectroscopy Mm -hmm. you know, that's classical way, or if you want to really want to learn something, you do silly. So it's literally yeah. no trouble. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, okay, were there any other questions from the audience? Um, I might jump in quickly. So you, you talked about the current flowing um, Kind of along the gate material. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, is there a way to put some sort of insulating layer in there and still maintain the permeability to the analytes? Like, can you actually reduce that uh, that current, you know, by by modifying the device structure? Yeah. So we've been looking at that a little bit. Of course, you can just increase the thickness of your insulator. Um, of course, because it's moisturized, 
um, that that moisturizing process just inherently makes it more um, more easily permeable by um, current. So that's something that we should be fighting against. And to some degree, we can just tolerate a small degree of uh, leakage current. That's sort of what we have to put up with. But that's certainly an option to potentially um, add up different insulators in there. Um, we'd have to be careful of the the solvents will allow us to deposit something else on top. So that's some that's an option that we can definitely pursue. We haven't um, gone down that route at the present because we're kind of happy to tolerate some degree of leakage at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, any final questions from anyone before we wrap it up? Um, if not, then uh, everyone, please join me in thanking Joshua for an interesting presentation. Um, so, uh, so thanks to, to Joshua, thank you to Millet as well. So both of our speakers today, uh, well done. Uh, if anyone is interested in giving a presentation at a future seminar, then you can get in touch with me. Uh, so uh, my email address should be in the invitation that you received. So you can, uh, can get in touch, send through an abstract if anyone is interested in um, presenting in this, uh, in this venue. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you everyone and uh, we'll, we'll leave it here. Um, so see you next month.